happen is once I turn in the rosters, staff education will assign a CBL um, to you with the name of this presentation, and that's actually the evaluation. You would go in and complete that evaluation, and then after you submit that, you should be able to print off your um, contact hour certificate. Um, so the title of this activity is Fire Safety with Rock. The purpose of this activity is to provide education to include key components related to fire safety in the perioperative setting. In order to earn a contact hour, you must attend the entire session, send the, sign the sign-in roster, and complete the evaluation. No influential financial relationships have been disclosed by the planners or presenters, which would influence the planning of this activity. And no commercial support or sponsorship has influenced the planning of the educational objectives or the content of this activity. And, um, had Monica sign that, so thank you. So um, thank you so much for inviting me here this morning to talk about fire safety. This is one of our annual education requirements that we have for our system. So if you haven't already done so, in addition to this presentation, um, we do request that you fill out a fire map of your area just to identify your toolboxes, your extinguishers, and your exits. I can say whenever we've done live fire drills on this campus, you guys do a fantastic job. And Monica shares that quite often you, uh, facilities comes and pulls the fire alarm. So it sounds like you have regular drills on fire safety, which is a great thing. Um, I don't know if you're aware, uh, Rock Sumner, our fire safety or our corporate safety officer, um, he has, I guess, kind of retired from the system. So his last day was last week. So I miss him terribly already. We always tag team fire safety across the system. So this might be the last time I get to use this slide, fire safety with Rock. Um, he really did have a wealth of fire experience that came with it, so I think it really enriched um, the education that we were able to provide. I know I've asked this question before when I typically do these presentations, how many of you have ever been in a fire? And I know a few of you have been in a fire in the community setting, not in the hospital setting. <coughs> I can share with you a few weeks ago, there was a fire um, in my neighborhood. I remember walking out the door and seeing this black smoke um, and um, making sure my girls were okay. I could hear all the um, response, so I knew that they didn't need me to rush there and say, I'm a registered nurse, how can I help? Um, they definitely had enough response. Um, I was able to kind of walk a safe distance where the community was kind of gathering, trying to figure out what had happened. Um, and I just want to share what was so impressive to me was how hot that was. And I was a very safe distance from the fire, and I can't... Um, share in words how impressive the heat from that fire was. So um, I know Rock always talked about it's not typically the flames that are going to kill someone, it's going to be the smoke. Um, and I was just taken aback and it really gave me um, a new perspective on how savages, how savage fires can be because I've never really been around one and although I wasn't directly involved in this, being a safe distance and feeling that heat was just incredible. So unfortunately, we have had two fires in our um, organization. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's going on with my computer today. Unfortunately, we've had two fires in our organization uh, that we are aware of. Uh, one was an airway, they both were in the 90s, one was an airway fire for a tonsil surgery um, and then one was related to an alcohol best based prepping solution that was pulled into some equipment and when the bogey ignited, it ignited the fire. Um, so we're not immune to these devastating events that happen. I don't know if any of you follow the news outside of our community here, but there was a fire in North Carolina about 18 months ago in an operating room. Um, it wasn't here in our area, but it was in a hospital in North Carolina. And kind of what I learned from that event is it was an emergency and they used an alcohol-based prepping solution. Um, and so that um, was the catalyst for that. So um, even though these are very rare events, they're um, definitely something that could occur in our setting. And so that's one of the reasons that we talk about this every year is how do we keep all the elements of the fire safety triangle separate to prevent fire. So, those are our objectives, and I'm sorry the screen is slided. We're going to talk about the three elements of the fire triangle and then talk about interventions that you can employ every day in your practice to keep our patients safe. So fires um, are considered a never event, and never <coughs> events are defined as serious um, errors in healthcare that are clearly identifiable, preventable, and 
um, cause serious injury or harm to the patient. And this is what's defined by the Center of um, Medicare and Medicaid Services. And fire safety falls as a never event. It is considered 100% preventable in our study. Um, and it's something that organizations really need to take a hard look at um, for prevention. So a surgical fire is defined as any fire that occurs in <coughs> or um, on the patient or in the surgical room, the procedural room, when a procedure is occurring. Um, what's interesting, I think, is in 2003, Joint Commission put out kind of an alert on fire safety. And what they do periodically is when they start seeing um, different incidents trending up, they'll send out an alert to organizations to say, assess your organization for these things because we've deemed these important for patient safety. Um, so that really got the conversation started in 2003, identifying fire safety as a signal alert. And then in 2006 is when it became a national patient safety goal. When I think about that, how serious fires are, 2006, that's not even 10 years ago. Um, and so we've been doing surgery a lot longer than that. Fire hazards have always been a patient safety risk for us, and it's really only been 10 years that we've really had these concentrated efforts, um, purposeful dialogue, and what specifically are we doing in organizations to keep um, patients safe. How many of you are familiar with the ECRI and what that stands for? Um, the ECRI is the Emergency Care <coughs> Research Institute, uh, but I think they officially changed their name to that acronym. It's no longer that acronym. Uh, but this is an important organization. It's a nonprofit organization, um, and they, um, they are a great resource for safety. They're, I think of them as the consumer reports for biomedical equipment. So you know how you read consumer reports to identify products and how they fall in the spectrum with other products? Well, this is a nonprofit organization that whenever there's any kind of biomedical equipment issues, uh, they're very good about sending out alerts um, to alert organizations that you need to look at whatever they send out as a learner and kind of do a deep dive in your organization. So it's nice to kind of have a safety watchdog out there that's a nonprofit organization feeding us information. And when we look at the statistics from ECRI, what they estimate is across our nation we do approximately 65 million surgical procedures a year. And from those, um, we can anticipate anywhere between 550 and 650 surgical fires to occur. Of those surgical fires that occur, 20 to 30 of them will have serious injuries with one to two deaths per year. So when you look at these statistics, what, what comes to mind when you have 65 million procedures a year and one to two deaths? Yeah, so what comes to my mind is that the the probability that you're going to be in a fire at work statistically is very rare and that you're going to have a patient injury is, is even rare. But it doesn't underscore those who are impacted. This has significantly impacted their life. Um, when I reached out to the fire department here at Greensboro in a calendar year, um, they reported 267 building fires. 124 cooking fires and 18 chimney fires for a total of 409 fires. So you are more likely to be involved in a fire in your community than you would be to uh, be involved in a fire at work. Um, so that's the good news. Um, the bad news is those one to two deaths, those 20 to serious injuries and those 550 to 650 surgical fires, that has dramatically impacted the patient, their family, the staff who were involved in the organizations that were involved in those. Um, so the results of a surgical fire, um, definitely the impact on the patient and their family. Um, it can, you could have minor injuries, depending on where the fire is, the patient may lose their ability to smell or to taste um, and, and, they, and they could die from it. So it definitely has serious implications for the patient and that's going to impact significantly the family and loved ones of that person. Um, also, when you think of the organization, think of staff who are involved in events that, um, or, uh, that um, we, don't, we don't come to work thinking we're going to have a bad event for the patient. And so um, the patient and the family are impacted, and so is the staff in the organization. Um, and this definitely, I think, leads to negative publicity of your organization, that if you have surgical fires breaking out, it really does question what safety 
metrics do you have in place to keep your patients safe? Um, and, and definitely it can be litigious where you're going to have legal ramifications for that. Um, so I do share two um, stories that I got off of a website called www.surgical fire.org and this was a, this is an organization that was developed they developed a website to educate healthcare workers and and um, just the lay public on the on the risk of fires that could happen in surgery and what prevention efforts should be in place and I like to share these two stories because these stories are what we would consider very minor procedures and so um, things that in our world you know, 20, 30 minutes um, of surgery time, procedural time, but yet if we're not exactly where we need to be, keeping those fire elements separate, um, devastation could occur. Um, so the first one is Jessica's story. She's a 13-year-old um, girl, and she was having a small cyst removed um, under her right ear. Um, and so when we think about um, an adolescent, 13-year-old, coming in to have surgery, to have a cyst removed. Again, we're thinking a minor procedure, 34 minutes in our area. This patient's going to be home that day, right, that afternoon. Um, well, a surgical fire happened. It went down her throat. She had to be intubated. She had to be hospitalized. And I just think of the impact on this patient and this family. Um, my daughter's 13 now, and if she had to have a small cyst removed, I'd be telling her, it's not a big deal. You're going to be home tonight. Um, you're not really going to feel any pain. It's, it, you'll be fine. Um, and so then the child wakes up in excruciating pain, is hospitalized. So not only the impact on the fire, but the impact that that had on, on the patient and, and, and their sense of security. Uh, the next case I call David's story, and again, this is another what we would consider a minor procedure. He was having a small remove, mole removed from his forehead, um, and during that procedure, a flash fire occurred, um, and, he, um, and it impacted his face there. Um, he had to go through several painful debridements, and he actually lost the skin under his eyelid. Now, eventually, they were able to re-graft that. And I think what really struck me when I was reading this story was also the patient's family account, that they felt that his face had been melted away. So again, surgical fires, when they happen, definitely impact the patient, they impact the patient's family, their loved ones, and, and the staff that are involved. So there are um, a variety of fires, and there are certain areas uh, when we operate that are considered higher risk for fires than others. So when we look at the statistics that are out there in the literature, 8% um, of the fires are reported to occur in the patient and 26% on the patient. 21% of the fires are um, happen in the airway, and we had one of those airway fires with the tonsil um, surgery. 44% uh, um, of fires are attributed to the face, and 75% are what's um, and what we call an oxygen-rich environment. And we define kind of the high-risk areas, everything ab above the xiphoid process. Because think about what activities are going on above the xiphoid process. We're definitely um, probably oxygenating the patient, and so that makes it a very high-risk area there, anything above the xiphoid process. And OSHA defines an oxygen-rich environment anytime you have the oxygen concentration above 22.5%. Um, so that's what's considered an oxygen-rich environment. So we do have several professional organizations that weigh in on fire safety, and they definitely define elements that organizations should have implemented um, to prevent um, surgical fires. So our professional organizations up there, the Association of Perioperative Registered Nurses, the Surgical Technologists, Association of Surgical Technologists, um, the Anesthesia, the American College of Surgeons, the National Fire Protection Agency. Does anyone in this room know what they do? And that's the organization that puts out building codes. And so um, I know in operating rooms, sometimes we get very challenged with our footprint and we, where we store items, whether that's equipment or soft items, or sometimes we want to repurpose rooms because we've just grown differently than what our original footprint had planned for. Um, so this is the agency that puts out those building regulations. And so that's why it's so important if you're going to repurpose a room, um, that you get corporate safety involved to make sure that we have the right doors, to make sure that we have the right 
walls that if we need a sprinkler system or whatever that looks like uh, that we have what's in place to repurpose that room um, now some of our um, rooms or our footprints are, are older like I believe at Wesley Long Day Surgery they don't have or is it here you don't have fire you don't have sprinkler systems yeah, so when, the, when, the, when this building was built, that was the code. But when you want to repurpose a room, that becomes very challenging because um, that's not necessarily the code now. That's why it's so important to get corporate safety involved whenever we do those types of things because we definitely don't want to repurpose a room and, and create a fire risk that we're unaware of uh, that could happen. Um, and then joint commission and local and state agencies we need to be mindful of. So I've been talking about the fire triangle. Um, there really is this chemistry that needs to be present for a fire to occur. And we commonly refer to that as the fire triangle. And I can share, and I know you all know, that we have an abundance of the fire triangle in, in our work area. I know when I talk to our new nurses coming into the OR, the OR residents, this is one of the first presentations that they hear. Um, I think when you're on the floor, I'm not sure you're thinking fire hazard, you know. Um, in our area, we definitely have to think about that and be mindful of it every single day because we do have an abundance of the fire triangle in our area. And these elements are typically found very separate, and that's our responsibility as a <coughs> team is to keep these elements very separate because when they converge, it is the perfect chemistry for a fire to occur. And something to keep in the back of your mind, even though we do purchase things that are fire resistant or fire retardant, that doesn't mean that they can't burn. Um, under the right circumstances, everything can burn. So what I'd like to do now is go over each of these elements and talk about examples that are in our setting every single day. And then if my computer is working with me today, um, Brock did have a video that he lights different things on fires and will kind of show that um, if it'll show up. Um, so the, what, are the th what are the three elements of the fire triangle? Right up there. Yeah, your oxidizers, your fuels, and your ignition sources. Absolutely. So we're going to start with ignition source. And Webster defines an ignition as to cause a fuel mixture to burn or to heat up or excite. So it really is the energy necessary to start a surgical fire. Um, when we talk about ignition sources, I think, you know, most commonly we think of that bovian laser. Um, and you're absolutely right. Those are two of the significant ignition sources that we have. 70% of the surgical fires can be attributed to your BOBI or your ESU unit and 10% related to, attributed to the laser. So they definitely are ignition sources that we have to be cognizant of. And what are we doing, what interventions are we doing to take that out of the equation to be the ignition source for the fire? What are other ignition sources that you probably will see today um, in your procedures? Light cords. Light cords. Yeah, the, the poster you have up in the hallway, the fire safety with rock, we had a lot of fun taking pictures of kind of the do's and the don'ts, and we definitely wanted to use the light cord as a don't. Um, I was so surprised how quickly that light source burns a hole in drain. It's almost instantaneously. It, 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 it blew me away. What are other ignition sources that we have? commonly think of defibrillator paddles being an ignition source, but they definitely can. Depending on the patient's body habitus, where they're placed, you can actually have an arc. Um, and we've seen safety zone portals in our procedural areas where um, the defib paddles have caused an arc, and that absolutely is an ignition source if the other elements are present for a fire. And you can see um, up here on the screen our electrical equipment, uh, mechanical injury, we can have trash fires. You know, if we throw the wrong batteries away, um, that they can, they can have energy in the trash and, and cause a fire. I didn't realize that we had um, battery-operated bovies in the system, ESUs in the system. Yes. Uh, yep. We have them here. We also have them in other procedural areas. That's something Rock and I started to um, assess this year is that we definitely talk about fire safety in the ORs every year. What other procedural areas might have fire risk and, and staff would benefit to have 
um, conversations and discussion and um, IR and cath lab, we've, we've started to reach out and they also have handheld BOBI units with batteries and so they have to be disposed of a certain way so that that's not causing um, an ignition source there. So there are a lot of elements that we work with every day. Probably all of you will be involved with these elements today um, that could be an ignition source. Um, so the next element of the fire triangle we're going to talk about is oxidizers. And Webster defines an oxidizer as one used to support the combustion of rocket propellant. So I don't, I hope we don't have any rocket propellant today <laughs> back behind the line. But it's definitely the gases that support combustion. So we talked about the high risk area is where you have a um, high concentration of oxygen um, above the xiphoid process is considered your high risk area. And the reason for that is we are typically delivering oxygen to the patient in a variety of modalities. Uh, they can have an endotracheal tube, they can have a nasal cannula, a face mask, but that's definitely where we're delivering what we know is a known oxidizer to the patient. Um, what are other oxidizers that we have in the OR every day? I would consider that a fuel, but yes, we do have that. So we have the air that we're breathing, right? Um, nitrous oxide, we have medical compressed air. You know, these are items, these are gases that we have every day back behind the line. Um, and so they're there and they can support the combustion of the fire. They, can, they, they continually provide that environment. So even if you don't have oxygen flowing on your patient, just the fact that you have ambient room air is an oxidizer. You know, think about when you're starting a fire at the campground. What do you do once you get it started? Don't you blow on it? Blow on it? Yeah. Um, so we have oxidizers all around us. Um, and it's just we need to be mindful in keeping the other elements separate. And so then the last element of the fire triangle is fuel. And Webster defines fuel as material used to produce heat or power for burning. So this is anything that's really going to feed the fire, right? Um, and this is something that we have all around us. So what are examples of fuel sources? Drapes. Patients' gowns. Patients' gowns. Prep solutions. Yeah, this is really all around us. Um, the patient actually can serve as a fuel. Their hair can catch on fire. Their body tissue can catch on fire. So it's not just what's on the patient. The patient itself um, him or herself can fuel that fire. Um, prepping agents. Um, we do utilize alcohol-based prepping solutions in our system, and the two that we currently have are DuraPrep and Chloroprep. DuraPrep is 74% alcohol by volume, and Chloroprep is 70% alcohol. Um, and 4% of surgical fires can be attributed to an alcohol-based prepping solution. So we've had a fire in our organization related to an alcohol-based prepping solution. The fire that occurred in North Carolina about 18 months ago, that was an alcohol-based prepping solution. So it is imperative that we, whenever we utilize these solutions, uh, that we wait a minimum of three minutes for them to dry. I think what's really scary, uh, my background is adult open heart surgery. And uh, when I started 20 years ago, 20 plus years ago, we used to prep our patients chin to toe with um, provodone iodine scrubbing paint and then alcohol. And we did not even think about, is this a fire hazard? I don't, I don't even remember fire education 20 plus years ago in the OR. You know, think about it, it's only been 10 years ago that we've really elevated that conversation. And I just think how dangerous, how absolutely dangerous our practice was. Um, thank goodness we ground our practice now in evidence-based practice and research and, and we've identified where we can do better. But I don't know if any of you had that experience where we used to just drench pa patients in alcohol mm -hmm. and I don't know that we were fully aware of um, the potential hazard that we were creating in that environment. Yep, um, linens and linens are all around us, right? The draping material, um, the egg crate that we use for positioning, the foam in the mattress scene, uh, mattress, there, um, there's a lot just with what the patient is on that can feed that fire. Um, dressings, again, they're made of a gauze material. Um, ointments, think about those petroleum-based ointments there. Um, you know, what's in our chromic? There's alcohol in that chromic, you know, so we just, it's just being mindful of where all the potential sources of the elements of the fire triangle are. Yeah, 
and then um, equipment and supplies. Again, our sponges and really a lot of what we use in the OR um, is very flammable. So this takes a, so when we say who's typically in control of the ignition source and who is typically in control of the oxidizer and who's typically in control of the fuel, sometimes we might break this out and say, well, it's the physician, the surgeon who's responsible for that ignition source because they're the ones maybe applying that energy. Um, and anesthesia is the one providing the gases to the patient. So, you know, they're typically in control of the oxidizers. And then it's the staff, whether I'm at the field or opening supplies up or positioning the patient, who's typically kind of involved in the fuel. Uh, but the reality is that we're all responsible for fire safety. And it, and it really does take the entire team to be very cognizant and aware of the fire hazards that we have um, and to make sure that we keep them um, completely separate. So what I'd like to do now is um, try to um, do this video. <coughs> and I don't know why it won't go up. So let me, um, let me do this. Sylvia Davis, call uh, 243. Sylvia 243. You guys, you guys can't see it on the screen. I don't know why it's not going up. Um, so, um, I'll just add lib. So, um, So before Rock left, he always wanted to do this live, and um, I was always just a little bit nervous to kind of set things on fire and add oxygen to it, um, <laughs> that all would work out well, because if it didn't work out well, I just didn't know how you would explain that to someone that we really <laughs> thought it was a good idea to set things on fire. Um, so um, I can send this to Monica, maybe, and you guys could look at it. It's, it's really a great video. What Rock um, does is... He takes several examples of what we have every day um, in our environment and he puts them under different circumstances and um, introduces different elements of the fire triangle to demonstrate the impact that that has um, with how it burns. Uh, so he starts with um, a material that we have that is fire resistant, so like our bunny <coughs> suits and our suture booties and our bouffants. Uh, they're actually made of a material that's fire resistant. Three out, resistant. Man, holding 101, three out, 101. Um, and so what he demonstrates is when you put a live fire to items that are fire resistant, they don't automatically combust and start burning. They just kind of really melt. Um, and so that is in an effort to keep someone safe that a fire just doesn't um, ignite on them, that it, it just melts. Um, but then he takes those same materials that he applies oxygen to it, and then you can see that transition where something that just melted now does start to burn. Um, and the takeaway message is anytime you have oxygen applied um, to an area, it's gonna the fire is going to be more vigorous, it's going to be hotter, um, it's really going to intensify that fire. So it's a great example of how something that um, under normal circumstances, ambient air is just going to melt, but then when you add the element of oxygen, that that item's going to burn. Um, and then he takes items that we use on the field that aren't fire resistant, like our lap sponges or our Raytex. Um, they're made of a gauzy material, right? They're um, made of cotton. Yeah, so they're not fire resistant in and of, of themselves. Um, and so he lights them on fire, and as you can anticipate, they, they start to burn. Um, and then he dips that same lap sponge in alcohol and burns it. Um, and it's like instantaneously that all of a sudden something that took a little bit. I mean, it's still burning, but it took a little bit to kind of finish the material. When you add alcohol, whoosh, um, big flames. Um, and he does the same thing with our drapes. So our drapes are meant to be fire resistant. Um, so again, they're not going to combust. They're just more likely going to melt when they have heat applied to them, he dips a piece of drape in alcohol and boom, it, it instantly um, burns. Um, and then the last part of this video, he has um, an endotracheal tube. Um, and endo endotracheal tubes, they're not going to necessarily melt if they catch on fire. What are they going to do instead? So, mm -hmm. and, and 
and what else? It's kind of like a blowtorch. Yeah, so it's not going to melt and, and disintegrate. Um, it's going to hold its form, but instead it's almost like a blowtorch um, going down the patient. And so really talking about that risk there. So I am not sure why my computer is not um, on my side this morning. Uh, but we can definitely, um, I can send this so that you guys can see this video. Because I think it's very powerful to see it um, and see the impact that those different elements have um, on fire safety. So with that, what are interventions um, that you can apply every day in your practice to keep patients safe? And they might be interventions that are reinforced today or um, something that you're going to start incorporating into your practice. But, you know, what are important aspects of patient care related to fire safety that you can be involved in? Yeah, so we know the high risk area is above the xiphoid process. So you definitely, um, that's high risk just because of how oxygen and gases are going <coughs> to the patient. And so when you add that element of alcohol based prep, you definitely are increasing that risk of, of, of fire in that area. Mm -hmm. And making sure the prep solutions are dry, dry at a minimum of three, three minutes. minutes. Yeah. We felt that that was such an important element that we incorporated it into our timeout poster. Um, I don't know if, if, if you guys realize that ha that hasn't historically been a part of our conversation. Um, and we felt it was such an important element for safety that we wanted to clearly discuss that if there's an alcohol-based prepping solution utilized in surgery, that it has been allowed to dry. And if it's a really hairy area that you're prepping, um, the recommendation is until it dries. And so that can take a lot longer, but a minimum of three minutes to dry. Absolutely. Um, when we brought chloroprep into the system, um, that was a really big deal because the even though we had Duraprep already in the system, that was something that the um, typically the orthopedic surgeons um, were utilizing. But those that were going to transfer to chloroprep were probably surgeons that were using povidone iodine, which is a water-based solution. And so all of a sudden, they were going to be using a solution that had a higher risk. Um, all of the surgeons who... Um, Use chloroprep had to sign a statement acknowledging that they understood the fire risk associated with that. And so it was primarily the general surgeons. Um, and my experience is we have very good compliance with our general surgeons waiting the three minutes. Um, so, um, yeah, we definitely want to make sure that that dries. And then I know you guys typically don't have traumas or emergencies here, um, but in, in the uh, larger ORs, the, the main ORs, you know, that's something to think about. If, if you typically prep with DuraPrep and it's a trauma, then maybe that's not the best prepping solution if you really need to um, start that procedure quickly, just like C-sections. Um, with SSI prevention, C-sections standardize their prep to DuraPrep. If it's an emergency C-section, that might not be the best prepping solution. It might be povidone iodine so you don't have to wait that three minutes um, because maybe you can't wait that three minutes for patient care. So it's something to keep in the back of your mind. What else? Well, making sure the light cords are secured up off the field and uh, you don't turn them on until you're ready to use them. Yeah. So, you know, when we do have those light cords for our cameras to make sure that they're attached, um, that we're not turning them on before they are attached because that can be a real hazard there. Absolutely. I basically attach it to my scope before I ever put it up on the field. That's a good practice. That is a good practice because then you're not running the risk of it not being not cutting it on. And, yeah, you know, it's on playing with it. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was uh, when we were doing that poster up there. How quickly that burnt a hole was! Wow, that's instantaneous. <coughs> the cord, but if you attach it to the scope, you, it's not hot. <coughs> mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's, it's really <laughs> hot on the cord. Mm -hmm. What else? Water mm -hmm. sailing on the field. Yeah, I, you know, I think that's really, sometimes I think um, when we get to not having saline on the field, we're thinking about being efficient and <coughs> do we really need the saline on the field? It's such a short procedure. That's why I really like the stories because those were short procedures. Um, those were what would be a very minor procedure. Um, might have been done in an office, right? Something very minor. Um, and yet a fire occurred. I can tell you the fire that we had, the airway fire, was a child. 
and the CRNA said it was the fast action of the surgical technologist at the field dousing the fire with saline that saved that patient's life. So don't ever underestimate the impact that you can have and how important it is to have readily available um, tools that we can, um, if a fire does occur, respond to it. Now I have been asked how much solution should be on the field and I'm not aware of any requirement that it has to be X amount of milliliters. I think you just really have to think about if a fire occurred, do I have immediately available what I need um, to react to it? Um, what else? So 10% of um, surgical fires can be attributed to the laser. So are we following all of the policies and procedures of how we keep that laser safe? Um, and those absolutely are important interventions. Deanna Graham, 250, Deanna, 250. Yeah, so yeah, we def um, any alcohol-based prepping solution is going to be a risk. So not only the three minutes to dry, if it is a really hairy area, it's going to take longer to dry. And so if we clip that area, we we take that 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 piece out of the equation. What about race and pass? And we go over these every year because if you're ever in a fire, um, we don't we want you to be aware of how to safely respond to that. Um, and so that's why we talk about fire education every year. Um, you know, race is on our bad bud buddy, badge buddy, passes on our badge buddy. What do they stand for? Yeah. And then what about pass? Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, we talk about those every year, so it does become second nature. I'm sure all of us, when we get on a plane, do do we need the the attendant to tell, alert us to look for the nearest exit? Don't we already already do that? So we're, we've got that safety already ingrained. Um, I'm the type that also reaches under my seat to make sure my flotation device is there. <laughs> and I also look to see what side of the aisle the emergency lighting is going to be, so that if I ever was that I'm already oriented to the safety that I'm going to need to be successful um, if I have the opportunity to be successful to get myself out of that plane. Um, in your areas, um, do any of you float to other ORs? I, you do? So think about, you might be very familiar with one footprint of a hospital and where the fire extinguishers are and where the pull boxes are and the exits. When you go to another hospital, are you as familiar? Um, and so, you know, that's something to keep in the back of your mind is um, when you go to other work area sister departments, um, where are these safety mechanisms um, so that if you do have a fire, you're able to respond. Um, I also think of our hospitals that, the ORs that have larger footprints. I might only work in one kind of pod of the hospital. These four rooms are where I typically work. If I'm pulled to go to another case on the other side of that OR, am I as familiar with where those safety um, those safety equipment is, and I should be, uh, because the time an event happened is not the time to realize I have no idea uh, where my nearest exit is. So just keep that in the back of your mind um, if you're rotating to hospitals. And then you also have staff that come to this hospital to help out. Um, I, I always encourage staff to kind of think about where they are. And then I think also the Bovey holster. Um, making sure that when that ESU is on the field that we are using the plastic holster so we are not accidentally leaning on the patient and we're taking that out of the equation. And we should use um, plastic Edna's plastic towel clips for them so we don't have a transfer of that energy. I know the Valley Lab rep used to wrap the bovie cord around a fluorescent light and then activate it and there was enough energy that came through the cord that would light up the light. So there is energy. Um, although it is safe, there is energy. What else? Well, thank you again for this opportunity to come present on fire safety. I apologize that my video um, didn't work. I can definitely send that to Monica so you guys can have it. Um, I'm not sure why my computer doesn't want to be my friend today. And um, do you guys know what month fire safety is? October, yeah, so next month starts fire safety. If you have um, small children, grandchildren, nieces and nephews um, that are elementary school age, they typically bring home an Edith book. I don't know if you remember that with your 
younger ones. Um, it um, it talks about you know fire safety at home, and it hopefully is encouraging families to talk about fire safety. And if a fire did occur, you know what would your plans be? How would you get out of the house and be safe? Um, so. Um, I've never experienced a fire. The closest I've been is the one in my neighborhood, and like I said, I was just um, profoundly impressed with the heat that I was feeling several safe blocks away, um, and just to see all the smoke, and it just reminded me what Rock really always emphasizes is that it's typically not the flames that are going to get you, it's going to be the smoke inhalation and, and how fast that can overcome someone. Thick, black, dark smoke. I am. Uh, I've never seen anything like it. Did what ha what happened? Did you find out? Um, I don't I don't know how the fire started. It started in the garage, um, and um, it, it engulfed the garage. Um, <coughs> our neighbor said he heard two explosions, and the next thing he knew, the house was the garage was engulfed, and um, it's a total damage. It happened in Sedgefield, a beautiful house, um, and it's completely. Uh, everyone got out safe. I think that's really the most important. Um, the sheriff's department did share with us uh, that everyone got out safely. Um, yeah, and it just it showed you know you're vulnerable. Um, and well, how do we keep back, these elements? Uh, Dr. Weiner had that big house fire, mm -hmm. destroyed his big beautiful house. Yeah, and that started like I think they decided in um, in an air conditioning unit or something. Yeah, yeah. It. it was in the attic. Yeah. At a neighbor's house, lightning struck. Mm -hmm. They were out of town, and we had the keys. Mm -hmm. And I mean, their house, the garage, it struck in the garage. Mm -hmm. Luckily, we had the house keys, and we went down there with the fire department. They had just left too. <laughs> I had to call them. <laughs> some bad news. Yeah. But luckily, no one was there. No, no, so. no. But I mean, it was just they figured it was a lightning strike on the outside of the house, and it developed on the inside. Yeah. In my area, we can burn leaves, and uh, I have a wood burning stove, and I empty my ashes one night, like I always do. And I look, like my daughter came home, and she said, Mom, you better come put the fire out. The woods beside me was on fire. <laughs> <laughs> so that was so embarrassing. I think it shows how quickly something can happen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't. None of those were purposeful, and then how quickly something can kind of get out of control. And so the statistics. You know, you're more likely to be involved in a fire in your community than in, at work, and there's still the risk here. We still have fires that have occurred in operating rooms um, and other areas. And I think that's why, you know, for operative services, this is something we're very aware of because we live with this abundance every day. Every procedure, we're surrounded by this. And um, the thought now is what other <coughs> procedural areas and areas really do have a risk for fire, and how are we preparing staff? To be safe, so um, so Rock and I were rounding with the different departments. I'll uh, when they name the new safety officer, I'll, I'll team up with them. But um, yeah, it's important that we talk about it every year. All of the hospital rooms, you got oxygen, you have electrical equipment. So yeah, it's like every room that's affected. Yeah. And when we think of our sister departments like IR and the cath lab, even though they do very different procedures, they have um, some of the same supplies and the same risk. And then when we think of like our PACUs and short stays, they're not doing procedures like we are in the OR or cath lab, but they do have their own unique risks that are there. So it is important to talk about. Um, and that's also why the fire drills are so good, um, to practice those skill sets of how would we evacuate. Um, if the best way is to put the patient on the blanket and drag them out, then that's what we need to do. Is the best solution to stay behind this fire door and call for help. So it's important that we practice these scenarios so that if you're ever in those scenarios, you're armed with that knowledge of how to respond. Any other questions? Thank you. Well, I thank, thank you for the opportunity to come, and I'm sorry. Daniel, we videoed it. You can okay. watch the video. All right. <laughs> thank you, Jim. You're welcome. <laughs>